So welcome to this panel on uh, open educational resources in uh, reappointment, tenure, and promotion dossiers. Um, my name is Christina Hendricks. I am uh, serving this year as the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning Pro Tem at UBC Vancouver. And I'm happy to be uh, moderating this panel today. So I'm going to start by uh, sharing my slides. I just have a few slides to begin with. Um, beginning with a land acknowledgement, UBC Vancouver is uh, in the Point Grey campus is hosted, excuse me, is on unceded traditional and ancestral Musqueam territory. And on the slide is um, uh, information about where you can find your own location on native-land.ca. And I'm joining you today from uh, my home in Vancouver, which is on traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. Um, and I wanted to share with you something that uh, I've done recently, which is I live relatively near to a new development that the Squamish Nation is, is uh, doing in uh, Vancouver, which is right below the Burrard Bridge. And so I walk by there actually fairly frequently and, and watch that going up. And I've been trying to learn a little bit more about that nation and um, their language. And in so doing, um, I... I had this, I, I watched this amazing video that helps helped me to understand how to pronounce the name of the nation. So um Rachel, I wonder if you could put into the chat the the spelling of the Squamish Nation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um so you know when you look at this word, um it's if you're not familiar with the way that that uh, the language is written, it may not seem very obvious how to pronounce it, but I found this fantastic video um, really breaking it down very carefully into each of the sounds. It's like five minutes long. It runs you through exactly how to say the words and what the marks mean, excuse me, how to say the, the sounds and what the marks mean. So uh, if someone could post that video into the chat, um, about how to pronounce that word. And I'm going to do my best. And I believe it is Kolmish. It's Kolmish. Um, and, and if you watch the video, it's fantastic. It goes through each syllable, but then it also has you go backwards. So mesh, hop, skop, and then and then you go forwards again. Kolmish. Um, which I think is really helpful and, and interesting. And, and something um, my son and I have been thinking about more lately is, is the ways in which some of the indigenous languages have used um, phonetic alphabets and uh, specific accent markers and, and letter markers. Um, and, and we're just really interested in thinking about how to learn how to pronounce those words um, more correctly. So wanted to share that with you in case you are ever using that word in, in your own um, context. Here today, we are talking about open education, open scholarship, and how do we uh, represent those in uh, reappointment, promotion, and tenure packages. And we have a fantastic lineup of folks today to talk about those things. So got me. I'm the moderator. We also have Elisa Bani Assad, who's Professor of Teaching and Computer Science and Acting Academic Director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology at UBC Vancouver. We have Amanda Coolidge, who's the Executive Director at BC Campus. Agnes Dontremont, who's Associate Professor of Teaching and Mechanical Engineering at UBC Vancouver. Jonathan Ichikawa, Professor and Department Head uh, in Philosophy, and his cat. <laughs> We're very happy to have the kitty here. Maya Kurzik, who's Associate Professor in Applied Biology and Forest and Conservation Sciences. And George Rieger, who's Associate Professor of Teaching in Physics and Astronomy, and also in Vantage College. So welcome to all of you. Um, and I've just got one more slide to share. <clears throat> 
And it just talks a little bit about the kinds of questions that we'll be asking. Um, they may or may not be in exactly this wording. And uh, I will also post them into the chat uh, as I'm asking them so far as I remember. Um, but generally, the, the topic for today is how do you include open education or OER work in a RPT, reappointment, promotion, and tenure dossier? So how do you categorize it? But we'll also talk a little bit about challenges or barriers that are present when doing so. Um, the degree to which others uh, recognize your work in open education as part of your academic or scholarly work. And then uh, thinking also about activities or support services at the institution or elsewhere that you would find useful for this purpose. And uh, to the degree that there's time, we might also get to a question around promoting OER work in other ways. Um, there's a couple other questions. Um, we just didn't want to include them all on the slide because there's quite a lot. And uh, just say a little bit about the format. So I'll ask folks to introduce themselves and a little bit about their work in open education. And then I'll start asking uh, the questions that we prepared in advance. And I will also be making sure to leave a uh, space towards the end for any questions uh, that participants in the session um, also have. So. You can post those in the chat. Um, I'm, I'll probably wait until you know a little bit later to get to the participant questions, but if you want to not forget, you can post them in the chat or uh, you can wait until later and, and hop on the mic, it's up to you. Okay, so without further ado, um, let me start by asking each one of you, to uh, let us know your name, department, although we've we've already noted that, but you can uh, remind us again, and one open education or OER project on which you have worked. So I will start with, uh, just looking at my screen, I have George up next, up first. Go ahead, George. All right, uh, hello everyone, I'm George Rieger, I'm from Physics and Astronomy, uh, and I became interested in, in OER, um, by wanting to solve a problem. And that is in our large first year courses, we have a lot of resources, you know, online homework, all of these things. And um, it was often very hard for students to get up to speed with, you know, registering for commercial online homework uh, database and then other things like clickers and so on. And so our work was to bring all course materials on into one platform based on an open textbook that became just available, the OpenStax physics textbook. And so uh, I integrated it in a weekly format and adapted it for the physics 100 purposes. So all course materials are now integrated into one website organized by weeks. So they have a pre-reading, they have qu quizzes, pre-reading quizzes, um, they have online homework, and all of that was made possible by the open OpenStax textbook. And then, yeah, we, we did some surveys and uh, I was happy to be part of a publication that in which uh, Christina is first author. Yes, it was a wonderful project. Thank you very much, George. Maya. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maya Krzyk, and I have a joint appointment with faculties of land and food systems and uh, forestry. Um, I am a soil scientist by training, and uh, when I was hired at UBC back in 2002, um, the group of soil science was kind of on its decline and I was one of the very few faculty members left. Um, and um, in such situation way back in early 2000s, I realized that there are certain disciplines of soil science that are absolutely necessary for um, training of both undergraduate and graduate students are going to lack at UBC for who knows how long. Um, so that prompted me to reach out to my colleagues outside of UBC with expertise in those areas um, to start developing materials um, on those topics um, that, that were needed. 
Um, so I, I really started developing these uh, resources back in um, 2004. I think I got my first TLEF grant and I continued working um, on development of those because um, our soil science group kind of started recovering in last maybe five plus years. Um, so over time I developed um, 20, I believe, different open educational resources. Uh, the most recent and probably the most extensive and comprehensive one is uh, Open Textbook, um, which is a national endeavor um, that involves 60 or so um, Canadian soil scientists contributing to this uh, open um, textbook for introduction to soil science. And I'm glad to see Amanda uh, Coolidge here because um, some of the funding for that book came from BC um, campus. Um, it's not complete. It's well, the English version has been released two years ago, and uh, we are still trying to release the French version um, of that um, textbook. So that's one of the examples of what we've done. Fantastic. Thank you, Maya. Jonathan. Great. Hello, I'm Jonathan Ichikawa. I'm a um, professor in the philosophy department. I'm also currently the, the head of the philosophy department at EBC. Um, so open access, um, uh, open educational resources that I've uh, been involved in. Um, the main one is a, a textbook that I um, uh, adapted slash wrote and made available um, free to, um, to students for a large um, introduction to formal logic course that I teach regularly. Um, it's gone through a few versions over the time. It's it's relatively low tech. Uh, um, I didn't embed it in a, in a whole network, although I have a colleague who's doing a little bit more of that, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so yeah, writing this textbook is the is the um, paradigmatic thing in this neighborhood that I've done. Um, a couple of other sort of angles that I that I know about and that um, I, I have some perspective on that are probably part of the reason I'm here. Um, I've spent some time. Uh, with the faculty association on contract negotiations, so I know our collective agreement like um, reasonably well, um, and um, so so have have some um, some of that kind of legal perspective there. As a department head, I um, am now in the position. I'm, I'm one year into this headship, so I haven't been doing this for for a long time, but I have sort of um, overseen promotion and tenure cases, and so I kind of have that angle of familiar familiarity on that process. Um, and I guess the other thing that I can mention in this category, maybe it depends on exactly how we define like OER, but um, if you include sort of uh, research outputs that are open access, um, I certainly um, make a point when I can to be publishing open, open access journals when I'm flush in research funding, which is sometimes, but not always, I uh, I, I pay the fee if I have to, to, to make the thing uh, available generally. So um, um, uh, public availability of research outputs is also something that I've been thinking some about. Wonderful. I can already see we've got such a, a wealth of, of experience here and still more to come. So Amanda. Go next. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Coolidge. I am executive director at BC Campus. And um, for those who are not aware, I'll just give a little bit of background. BC Campus works with the 25 uh, post-secondary institutions across the province of British Columbia in the areas of teaching and learning and open education. And um, we have been an organization for 20 years now. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And since that time, we have been very involved in open education. Um, we're very committed to access to education uh, broadly for students, faculty, et cetera. And so, um, as you may be aware, in 2012, we started the Open Textbook Project, which is where we house a lot of our open textbooks that you might be using. And most recently, we've branched out that open, those open resources to include open course collections. So really looking at ways that we can include more resources that are openly licensed that would help instructors um, use various um, curriculum resources that would be useful for students. So yeah, so that's kind of where where I'm coming from. And then um, I have another angle that I'll talk 
about later with regards to tenure and promotion, because I'm also very interested in how we can affect policy um, with regards to open education. Great, thank you, Agnes. Hi, I'm Agnes, I'm in mechanical engineering. Um, one of my more recent OER projects, um, it was just found by BC campus, in fact, that first year engineering, the major gap in open textbooks or open resources was engineering mechanics, which is one of the things that I teach. And I was already interested in um, creating some resources for this. So over the past four or five years, I've been working with a team at Penn State on an open textbook online, um, and we've been building like mad um, open homework problems in web work to try and recreate resources that could replace a commercial textbook in first and second year mechanics. And uh, we've actually adopted this textbook uh, and the web work resources at for four institutions now. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Go ahead, Elisa. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Elisa Bani Assad. Um, as Christina said, I'm acting academic director at CTLT um, for the next little while and am normally housed in computer science, which is where I you know, do a lot of my, I mean, I do all of my teaching in computer science and have done all my OER style work there. Um, my main contribution in that is just sort of making a bunch of online materials like I've never I haven't used a textbook that students would have to purchase in a really long time. In my field, it's just the textbooks go out of date in about a year. So it would just be really problematic to I, I would just like I would just need so much shelf space even to house the textbooks for myself. So it just very quickly became clear that curating materials and making them available online um you know, almost as you know as soon as the web was a thing <laughs> was the best way to go and so it's been a really long time and then i also um did make a series of videos that support one of the classes that kind of became like a video textbook um so that's you know so i've, I've done a, a few and then of course during COVID, i generated a load of videos as we all did and then those have kind of become a learning resource for the team of people that teach that class. Not that they necessarily use my videos, but they're kind of have become like, you know, we sort of have them archived as a way to see different spins on on different topics. So that's kind of neat, actually. We kind of sometimes put them next to each other and play them and say, oh, these are different ways of explaining the same thing. So they have become sort of um, almost a research archive as well in terms of pedagogy around certain topics. Um, and in term, and I and I've thought a lot about how these are represented in tenure and promotion. Um, I, you know, some of the questions that I think we'll be addressing are really vital because I think people do feel very confused about whether it sits in the category of excellence in teaching or innovation in teaching, or in something that's more, you know, that that has that impact to others. Um, so, looking forward to the discussion on on those concepts. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Like I said, there's this really wealth of, of um, fantastic experience in creating, using OER, um, and people from different disciplines and in different faculty positions. And it's great to have Amanda from BC campus here as well. So I'm actually going to start with Amanda from BC campus because um, one of the, the catalysts for this discussion is that there was a matrix created by, and let me make sure I get the name of the organization right. It's D-O-E-R-S-3, Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success. D-O-E-R-S-3. I think, Will, you have a, a, <clears throat> a link to post into the chat. Um, but Amanda was part of a group in that uh, organization that put together a matrix for OER work and tenure and promotion, which uh, Will has just put into the chat. And so here's my question for Amanda. Could you describe the DOERS3 matrix and the motivation for creating it? Sure. So um, you can actually use it. You can say the acronym as DOERS3, just 
yeah, there you go. Um, and um, so maybe I'll just give a bit of background as to what Doers 3 is. So one of the things um, as BC Campus, uh, we um, fortunately are recognized uh, globally for the work in open education, which means that all of you who are involved with open education are recognized globally for the work that you've done. And as such, we have the opportunity to work with a wide number of organizations. And one of the areas where we noticed we needed some more support in is working with other system-like organizations like ourselves to figure out how best to do some of the open education work. So we joined a group called Driving Open Education Resource Sustainability for Student Success, or Doers 3, and that's a collaborative. It's a group of 35 public higher education systems that are both statewide and province-wide, and we're really committed to supporting students' success by um, promoting free, customizable OER. Um, we serve over 7.5 million students at 814 colleges and universities in the U.S. and Canada. And it was initially launched in 2018. And so really what it does is it helps organizations implement scale and sustain OER by advancing research and policy, sharing tools and learnings and showing how OER can foster equity and student success. So one of the working groups that um, I was a part of is called Capacity Building. And in that um, area, we really identified that a critical part of sustaining OER in higher education is recognizing the contributions by instructors who create and improve OER as part of their professional work. So anyone who's familiar with the OER community knows that questions about the role of OER work in tenure and promotion and re uh, reappointment are constants, uh, constant questions where any practitioner or administrator congregates. However, as the criteria for tenure and promotion can wear, vary widely between different types of institutions um, and even between different departments within an institution, answering questions about the role of OER in the tenure and promotion process can seem really daunting. And so um, one thing is, is that we did some early research and found that, um, according to James Skidmore at the University of Waterloo, he recommended that institutions recognize the creation of OER in the TMP process. He said doing so um, would communicate clearly that institutions of higher education take seriously the responsibility to tailor knowledge to students and to re reduce barriers. And so what we did as a group is we developed an adaptable adaptable matrix, which I think is being linked in here, to help guide faculty as they attempt to include OER work in their tenure and promotion portfolios. So we initially thought of soliciting the OER community for pre-existing TMP policies that included OER, um, so we could draft a model policy that the community could use at their own institutions. But we had to set this aside partially because um, there's so few pre-existing policies that would fit the bill, but also because we didn't want to appear that we um, were suggesting some sort of a top-down solution. So due to the variance of the tenure and promotion process, we essentially ruled out a model policy. Um, and what we came up with was more of a bottom-up approach. So we wanted to help faculty, staff, and administrators change the culture of their institutions. And we felt that the most effective way to do that was to create an adaptable matrix. Um, and we knew from research that while individual institutions may differ from this matrix and its categories, most variations of a TMP guideline can be adapted into teaching, research, and service. So we then determined that the best approach was to systematically think about how OER work, um, a varied class of work itself, might fit into the three categories of research, teaching, and service, which then resulted in the development of the mat matrix. So as you'll see in the matrix for each contribution, we've suggested whether the contribution could apply to those three categories, and in some cases have marked multiple categories, and which one is most relevant will really depend upon the context. In addition, the matrix includes examples of how faculty might think strategically about where their open education contributions would be valued best, um, and how best to frame those contributions. And just so you know, this matrix is in no way exhaustive, but it may be useful as either for faculty to really start thinking about how to best fit their OER work into their local TMP guidelines. And faculty documenting their OER work in portfolios should characterize the, their work using these terms to help colleagues understand their contribution. 
And this, the current form was created with individual faculty in mind. We do um, encourage tenure and promotion committees to adapt or edit the document to use as guidance for their faculty. Um, it is CC BY. And we hope that you might be able to adapt this based on the needs of your institution, your department, et cetera. Wonderful. Thank you for that, um, Amanda. And I was excited to see this come out. And I think it still can be quite useful. Um, it, it does separate out um, categories into research, teaching, and service, as you mentioned. And um, what it does is, is list out various things like creating OER, using OER, adapting OER, doing research on OER, and then you know where each of those could fall under research, teaching, and service. So I think it can be a really useful um, matrix to think about. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, which is a very broad question and you know whoever wishes to answer could be uh, applicable to most folks here. Um, I'll put it in the chat. If you have included or plan to include OER work in your reappointment promotion and tenure dossiers, how have you done so and under which category? So I, I will note that we have folks in two different um, faculty streams here at UBC. We have folks in a educational leadership faculty stream and uh, folks in educational leadership and teaching and folks in a research and teaching uh, faculty stream. So um, maybe we'll start with the educational leadership. Um, George, Agnes, Elisa, who would like to begin? Sure, I, I can jump in. I think um, educational leadership is a really easy place to put a lot of OER work. It makes a lot of sense. We're talking about a definition that's impact beyond your classroom. And so anytime you've created something where someone else is using it or have, you know, taught another instructor about how to use a tool or supported someone in building their own OER that falls under educational leadership. And so I think it's really easy to put a lot of this work there. Um, I but I've also put, you know, adopting OER in my own classroom under teaching and service um, being, you know, reviews or um, other other things like uh, fund adjudication and things like that. Great, thanks, Agnes. Um, I was just finding the definition of educational leadership, and I uh, I believe this is. The correct one. It is activity taken at UBC. I think it should be actually or elsewhere. Mm, maybe it's and elsewhere. <laughs> to advance innovation in teaching and learning with impact beyond one's own classroom. That was my quick Google to find it. It may be pretty close. <laughs> uh, Lisa or George, anything to add to this question? George, do you want to take it? Okay. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I, I think it kind of splits for me. Um, I think there are a couple of, I think just same as Agnes, I think there are a couple of, um, ways to categorize OER work. I think it's, I think there is a sort of concern around double, double listing things when, um, in the educational leadership track, there's a kind of obsession around like, is it service or is it, educational leadership or is it teaching or is it educational leadership and I think that this really needs to be dispelled because there are aspects of the same activity that are you know one or the other and that doesn't mean that the whole activity has to be listed under one or the other um, so excellent creation of an OER piece of content um, that nobody uses but is a good thing in and of itself or only your class uses is teaching um, it's excellence in teaching. You've created an artifact that is excellent within your own classroom, and that is an excellent thing. And you have maybe even done reflection on it within your class to say, I've checked that people aren't swiping past parts of the video, or I'm making I'm I'm maybe mining through it to see which parts of the video people go back over. And I'm feeding that back into my reflective process for teaching to say, obviously my description of that concept 
was too encoded. People needed to watch that three times. Next semester, I will expand on that concept. So that is all within the core of excellence in teaching. As soon as you communicate any aspect of that out for any reason, all of that becomes educational leadership. As soon as you communicate out, I did, I, I explained this concept in this way. People needed to watch it five times. And then I explained it differently in a more expanded form. Second semester, people needed to watch it once. Then you have something to say. You aren't just applying that knowledge within your own class you are able to communicate that learning out to other people. And however you do that is impact beyond your classroom. And that is educational leadership. You can do it as a paper, um, which is convenient for the reviewers of your promotion and tenure case, because then they know that you did the work rigorously. Um, they know that three other people in a good venue read your dissemination and were able to say, yes, that was well done work that that had meaningful impact. Um, or you can count the number of people who viewed your blog post about it, or you can um, just collect experience reports from people, or you can simply describe that you made it available, that you have no statistics around usage whatsoever, but it's publicly viewable. And your approach was rigorous such that if somebody in theory came to look at it, they could believe those findings. And that those are all elements of educational leadership. Um, so I think it's I, I think it's about convincing your promotion and tenure committee and the and the you know senior appointments committee that what you've done has or could have impact beyond your classroom. Um, you know, based on the fact that it's robust work, it's something that was done at a high quality and that it's generalizable to somebody else's context. Um, and there are various ways to prove that. So you can say, well, somebody used my videos in another class. It, so it worked, it generalized to somebody else's context or somebody cited my paper. So it generalized to somebody else's context or whatever. However you want to demonstrate that evidence of impact is totally your call. Um, so I think that is really the conversation. It's really about like, you're creating the excellent materials or you're disseminating reflection about the um, or you're disseminating the materials or reflection about the materials. Um, and that dissemination is the educational leadership piece. And so it appears in both. The conversations about each of those items is very different, right? So like in your teaching section, in your excellence in teaching section of your dossier, you talk about the way you made the things, the way you know they're excellent, the evidence-based approaches that you used and all of the reflection that you did. And you talk about your introspection about those things. Whereas when you, then in the second half of your dossier and your educational leadership portion of your dossier, you talk about all of the ways you know that these are generalizable evidence of impact. And so it's two completely different conversations that you're not double dipping. You are having two different ways, two different lenses on perhaps the same experience. Um, and I think that's a very important point to hammer home to EL folks that you are not you are not cheating by talking about something from two different perspectives. It's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it uh, was very nice. Um, just want to add very quickly that because OER is so customizable, uh, it, it also allows you to, you know, come up with a template that works for your class, but then, you know, you can also share it with colleagues and they can add materials or, you know, or, adopt materials from you and, and use it for their own class. So it call, could also be easily part of service that way. Um, but I, I completely agree. It, it really falls mostly in into educational leadership and teaching. That's where I have put it in the past the most. Yeah, thank you. Me too. <laughs> it was mostly in educational leadership and teaching because I'm also an educational leadership faculty. But we also have two faculty members in in uh, the research and teaching stream. So we'd love to hear from you um, how you've categorized your work. Maya, maybe just start and then Jonathan. Well, I guess I can start. Yes, I come from a research stream and um, our CV template looks different um, than the other stream. And um, 
it's it's really geared towards research and it is for somebody like me who has lots of these um, open educational resources a struggle to find a, a correct spot and not to do the double dipping and to provide the evidence and in our in our template there isn't really anything specific about educational leadership so there is lots of things that I have to explain um, between between a framework that is not geared towards any innovation in teaching. I mean, in research stream, wanted or not, we are told just do um, you know solid teaching, and that's about it. Um, so where does where does this extra stuff um, go? Um, I just submitted my package um, right now for for promotion. Um, this is my second attempt. I tried once several years ago, and um, it was a very stressful and lengthy process because of these, um, these extracurricular activities that I've done on educational leadership and, uh, and teaching side that were a different level of, uh, of assessment were viewed very differently by different folks. Uh, it was very uneven how different people saw my uh, my CV. Some were really delighted with it and others were not. At the end, I wasn't successful and I thought I will never go again. Um, I decided to try again. So I repackaged things differently this time around. I uh, put all of these educational um, resources um, under the publication in terms of here they are, and this is what they are, and this is who is using them. And here is the um, uh, the usage of, of the uh, of open resources because I follow some of that um, in Google Analytics. Um, I beefed up a little bit that better, I think, um, in terms of supporting information um, how many papers were published? I mean, papers in research uh, stream are the easiest and most obvious way that um, that people who are assessing us know, but it's not just about publishing papers about your open educational resources. What, what I found out coming from the research stream is that my colleagues in this stream don't really understand and before pandemic, first time I went for, for promotion before pandemic, people really didn't understand at all how much work it goes into development of these things. Um, so it was like, well, I got questions um, asked, well, is, is developing one educational resource same as writing one paper? Well, <laughs> Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but what is really different, especially when you have um, these resources for a long time, there is a maintenance. Once you publish a paper, you are done with that paper, it's done. Um, you know, you don't come back and revise that same paper, but with open educational resources, in order for them to be functional, functional and usable, you have to do the maintenance and some refinement in, in some cases. And that is really different than, than just publishing a paper. So anyhow, um, I put these, uh, these as I said, um, I, I listed them under the references. Um, I try to separate what is service and what is teaching more this time around. Will I be successful? I have no idea. I'm just embarking this once again, but I, I'm glad that there is a discussion of this kind because um, if we are, because coming from a research stream, I'm getting a message in last 10, 15 years that for us in research stream is really okay to do just an average teaching and, and just cruise along. And, and being at an academic institution, I don't think that's, that's right. We, we still, even if, the, uh, if our focus is on research, we are educators and we have to, we have to put effort in, in 
in educating the students and transferring the excitement about our discipline and innovation in our discipline and research in our discipline to, to younger generations. So we can't just focus on research because we are not just a research institution. Um, so I, I hope there is, there is, you know, less of a stringent division between the research stream and educational um, and teaching stream because it really sends a wrong message to young faculty members who are coming that you should just do this or you should just uh, do that. We, we need to be, be doing both of those or all of the three things that we are being assessed in order for institutions like UBC to be successful in everything that we do, which is educating educating young people. Thank you so much, Maya. Thanks for sharing your, your story and the struggles that, that you've experienced. Really appreciate that. Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, at, at, as Maya says, it's a lot um, uh, harder to um, find the right box for a lot of these kinds of things in, in the research stream than educational leadership, um, um, at least when we're talking about these kinds of classroom classroom resources and the like. Uh, you know, if one publishes in an open access journal, that's straightforward and, and um, uh, yeah. Um, but if you're doing something like um, uh, like a textbook or classroom resources, um, yeah, we don't have a natural box for it. Um, so I, I, I reminded myself, I, I pulled up my, um, my promotion um, CV from a few years ago, and my textbook uh, is alluded to twice um one is um under teaching there's a little um heading that um is often just kind of left blank but it says areas of special interest and accomplishments and i wrote a couple sentences saying um, um about talking about the textbook that i wrote and, and why um and then i did also list it in what's intended to be the kind of the research section but there's publications and then there's like in other publications um sort of setting aside from peer review kinds of things so i also listed it there um i in in my particular case um i i think that um so it's it's my my career has not been kind of um focused especially in these areas so i've been doing um the amount of kind of more traditional um publication that you know tenure committees often want so um so i i don't really have the sense that this was particularly relevant for my promotion. I think I think I was promoted on the strength of more traditional research and things, but I did make a point of putting it in my CV um, in those locations. Great. I see Elisa, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Jonathan, just listening to you talk and also Maya, like it it occurs to me that academia has really changed in um, over the hundreds of years, I think it used to be that perspectives on the field, um, these insights where you could take a topic and distill it such that it could be digested it, by students was an innovation within your field. I guess now we would sort of call it deeper, you know, discipline-based education research. Um, it's, it's this, but we don't respect it as much. It's, it's like there's, Instead, there isn't a lot. There aren't a lot of venues where you can write an essay reflecting on a conceptualization of a of a of a difficult topic in your area, or nobody's publishing their lectures anymore. But this really is what this is, right? You're publishing your lectures, and so if you had made it into a book format where you were publishing a philosophical thought on a concept, then that might be more digestible to the senior appointments committee as a publication. Um, but because the target audience is students, suddenly that devalues um, the, the publication impact in their minds. Um, but that never used to be the case. So in computer science, we have all these essays by this giant of the field called Dijkstra, and he was speaking not just to, pra to practice practition practitioners, he was also speaking to students. And these are like held up as these it, huge, um, you know, these, these major works of the field. Um, and nobody would say, well, these are just lectures. They don't, they don't count as being impactful. 
Uh, so maybe it's a, a, an optics issue. I mean, maybe we really have to start saying these are not just lectures for an individual group of students. These are us framing, carefully framing and thinking about the way to communicate these pedagogical concepts throughout the ages so that people will be able to see our point of view educationally on what the uh, on what these topics really are so that they can be communicated be by other people and also so that people can better understand the current state of thinking about these topics to maybe even inspire future research in these topics uh, as a launching point for further inquiry within the discipline. Um, so these are not just things that kids use to learn a little bit. These are deep investigations of our topics in by extreme experts in each of these fields. Um, so I think I think we want to raise the profile of these materials to that level. Thank you. That's that's a really interesting way to frame it and and think about it because it makes me think about like the audiences, right? If it's if it's for your class, that's an audience. If it's for your peers, that's another audience. And it seems like these things can cross those audiences, right? So it's not. Um, it's not that you know one is only teaching and the other is only research. I mean, I think that's super interesting. But anyway, that's what I got out of your comment. So <laughs> appreciate that. We've already started to get into this question, um, which is challenges or, or barriers is the next question. So, and I see there's great things happening in the chat. Um, but uh, anybody who hasn't yet spoken, I know there's been a couple of things spoken about challenges or barriers, either that you have encountered or that you've heard from others. Amanda, you're welcome to also uh, share anything too um, about representing OER work in, in reappointment, promotion, and tenure processes. Sure. I mean, I think the most, and this will resonate, I think, with everybody here, is that for so long, open education work has been seen as a side on the side of the desk work. It's not considered part of your everyday work. And so it's kind of considered like, oh, they do that work. Look at that pet project that so-and-so works on. That's a really cool project and yay for them and good for their students. But they're somehow we're inherently missing the value. And until there's like a recognition of the the value and the sort of respect for that work, I think, um, you know, that's sort of a, that's a cultural conversation. Um, and so I think that becomes a real challenge. And like to each of you here who are doing it, I mean, congratulations, because I think it's such a wonderful example of just like perseverance and doing something that is completely aligned with your value system and what you truly believe education should be about and for. And so, um, and I think sometimes when we get so entrenched in like what is considered proper academia requirements, um, we forget about the real purpose and value of why we're in an educational institution, which I think goes back to what Elisa was saying very similarly. But I think that becomes a big challenge. And I mean, I am not an academic in an institution, but um, that's what I hear is that the challenge is how do I move it from being the side of my desk to being a valued piece of my, con my the contributions of my day to day work. Thank you. Any other barriers or challenges that folks haven't mentioned yet? I can quickly mention too, it's yeah. time and money. <laughs> um, when when I started doing the OER work, uh, the OER fund didn't exist. And, and so um, we practically did it on our own time. And um, since, since we didn't really know what comes out of it, it wasn't also really not not very recognized. So um, so at the time there, there was a bit of risk involved in that and definitely a lot of time input from our side without much support. Um, we, we did manage to get a TLEF grant for it and help from some grad students, but um, yeah, the uh, that there is now support is, is really a, a wonderful development and um, promoting this that there is support that there that there are people that have done it and that it's now more recognized is really a good development. 
The other, oh, one, one more quick thing, and that relates to what Maya has said. One thing that is still difficult to get funds for is if you have to replace or, or make an OER project better. So, you know, if, if the OER is already existing, then in, then making it better or replacing it doesn't mean meet OER criteria, right? Because you're not saving the students money. Uh, you're just future proof it. It's really helpful, George. Yeah. And I just wanted to give a shout out to students for um, the OER fund because it was really strong student advocacy from the Alma Mater Society at uh, UBC Vancouver who um, made that happen. And then again, we just got it renewed. So I'm um, super excited for that. But appreciate your points about sustainability. That's a good point. Anybody else have barriers or challenges? Agnes? I think one of the challenges that I've encountered is trying to quantify impact, especially for things that are out in the world. You know, if you've got a paper, you can find the number of citations on that paper. If you've published through a commercial publisher, you call them up and say, how many books have you sold? Um, but something that's just available online for downloads that maybe, you know, in your Google Drive or something, um, it's hard to measure the impact of that. You don't know who's using it or how much they're using it or how many students. And so that that is one thing that I've struggled with. Yeah, I definitely have as well. I remember, I think I counted YouTube video views and downloads of slides on a slide sharing website and things like that. Like it is just challenging. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, I think another, I mean, maybe this Agnes kind of goes to your point too. I think um, in infrastructure, I think is a challenge. So finding a platform, finding um, a hosting service, you, you hook up with one group and then it gets defunded and then all your videos disappear or they get delinked and it's a disaster. I mean, it just, it's like, we aren't, um, you know, we, we aren't printing presses and nobody would ever have expected us to be, but we are expected to be people who can somehow do a lot of data management around our, our resources and software developers to some extent, right? Um, and that is, you know, and I am a software developer, so why can't I do it? But it is actually really non-trivial to, um, to, to try and make that work. It's, um, I, I think, you know, it, it would be worth having a conversation, all of us maybe about how, about our technical needs around OER and how we can try and get the, the you know, maybe we pool our money or do something to try and get the kind of infrastructure that we need because we need to be able to do those things, Agnes, like you said, like we need to be able to count views and to even be able to do a, hey, you've watched six videos, you have to do a little survey about how good they are or whatever, like, you know, something so that we can get the data that we need to make it obviously worth it, that we've done it, as opposed to just knowing in our hearts that it was worth it. I think that that's the real issue is that universities, I think, you know, generally universities generally don't believe the people who are creating any of the content that their content is good. That's why you have to publish somewhere else or get a grant from somewhere else or get letters from somewhere else. You're always, you always need an external opinion about whether what you've done is any good. And so if, if we can somehow get data around it to, to help build that picture, then that would be hugely helpful. Um, otherwise, what the letter writers have to do, they actually have to go in and watch the videos and see if they're good and do the assessment themselves. And they're probably not going to do that. They might watch for two seconds, but they're not going to do a whole inventory. They're not going to do their own entire analysis about whether we've actually improved the field by providing these videos. But we could maybe figure out a way to do that in a robust way that would be believable by the Senior Appointments Committee. So I think it's it's worth putting our heads together on, on that. Yeah, that is a big problem. I'm also thinking about um, platforms that have existed and then disappear after a while. Like I have a number of OER things on various platforms like YouTube is not gonna go away anytime soon, but you know, someday 
Um, and then uh, one or two other things that I put stuff on have just disappeared <laughs> to the ether, right? So having like persistent URLs, DOIs, like just a permanent place for things to go. The, the library, I should say, uh, the library uh, institutional repositories um, uh, can be really useful for that purpose. But um, anyway, that's a great conversation uh, to, to uh, start and, and think about further. Wanted to move on to another question specifically for Jonathan, but could be anybody else really, and that's about um, department chairs. So, any thoughts on how department chairs might uh, support faculty members in representing OER work? Yeah, thanks. I, at least in my experience, the um, the questions aren't all that different. So, so I think of in, in the cases that I've been involved in so far. Uh, um, uh, the role of the department head in a promotion tenure case is large, um, but it's sort of, um, it, it's, it's about kind of taking the file and the referee reports and, uh, um, crafting a letter that kind of becomes the main, like, cover letter for the file as it goes up through the committees and everything that, that really, um represents the the case for the promotion so when i did when i did that with with two colleagues last year um there were both cases where it was clear to you know within the department it was clear to me that um these were promotion cases to support um and um my uh job was to um explain that case in a way that's going to be legible to 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 DAC and the SAC. Um, so a lot of what we've been saying already is kind of the same thing. Um, I, I mean, the department heads are um, are doing this work in a like sort of at a different scale. You know, so like the candidates dossier is very large and it includes lots of things and hopefully includes some pointers to like things to pay attention to. Um, the the head needs to write a letter. It's not a short letter, but um, but you know the 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 part about that um, you know this particular OER resource is probably a paragraph. Um, and it, it needs to explain in the case of an educational leadership file why it's um, um, educational leadership, which includes especially um, uh, impact kind of on pedagogy outside of uh, outside of the classroom. Um, and um, and if it's a research file, well, that's that's tricky, right? I haven't really dealt with that as I, as I have that side of things. Um, I did have I did have a um, educational leadership file come through that included some some things in this neighborhood. Um, and so part of that was explaining to like the kind of generalist committee um, why this is significant, why it's important. And yeah, the more um, the more metrics we have, the easier that is. Um, uh, letter writers can um, can say helpful things. Um, the uh, they they don't, as I understand it, um, these uh, promotion committees. Um, it's it, it's a, it's a little bit less of that. I mean, I was, I was really impressed by like. Um, Elisa's remark about, um, you know, it's too much to ask for people to kind of watch the video and decide for themselves whether it's good. And that's true, but it's also not even exactly the question that, that like they, they care that much about. Uh, it's not even so much is it good. It's really, is it influential? Is it, is it, is it doing this stuff um, uh, amongst the scholarly community? Um, and so the, 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 more th the more things there are that are um, kind of objective or close to objective measures that that I can write about in a letter, the easier that job is. Um, like it, maybe something like, um, you know, view counts could be interesting. I, I didn't have anything like that in my case. We do talk citation counts sometimes in, on, on, on the research stream. Um, but um, if there are things like, you know, here is um, a list of universities where this material is being used. Um, or if a letter writer talks about their experience and how it's transformed their classroom, then I can relate that story as part of the letter. Those are the things that are a lot um, easier to convey in this kind of a context. Great, thank you. Anyone else have thoughts about department heads and supporting OER work? Uh, yeah, Lisa. I just had like a little tiny follow-up to what Jonathan said about the influence. I think, honestly, I think, Philosophically, I think that you know, and not not your kind of philosophical, I think casual, lay philosophically. Um, I I feel like influence is a proxy for quality work. It's a proxy for being able to assess whether somebody is doing something that's important. Like 
you know, being able to look at an artist's body of work while they're alive and say, wow, this is amazing. We don't value that until after they've died and it's suddenly $2 million for a painting, right? But it would be great it's not going to happen if our institution was able to look at the work while the person is still alive and applying for tenure to say, wow, this is incredible work. We just, I just think we have to own the fact that we don't necessarily know how to do that. Um, but we could try. I mean, we could, we could probably try. We could probably come up with more ways to um, incorporate valuation of things while uh, in terms of their inherent goodness rather than just that we're not really influence machines, right? We shouldn't really be influence machines. The influence should be a byproduct of excellence at our jobs and, and having the thoughts that are important. Um, Nobel prizes aren't given out for years later. Hiring a bunch of Nobel laureates is, is a great way to make your institution look great, but you're not the one generating the Nobel winning ideas. Um, so we wanna be the generators for ideas. We wanna be the incubator for excellence within our work. And so I think that's the, the, the tenure and promotion process is a proxy for thinking about things like that, like trying to guess who is it that we should invest in a lifetime way who is going to have these incredibly important thoughts that in a hundred years will have had an influence. We try and predict short-term influence as a proxy for long-term influence. Is that even right? Um, I think that there's a, there's a case to be made that we need an inventory for being able to assess excellence within our, within our own scope um, and not be lazy about it and not outsource it, which is what yeah. I feel like we're kind of doing right now. No, I, I, I really um, agree with that as a matter of value. I, I, this is making me notice a thing I, I hadn't really, that hadn't been salient to me before in our contract language, um, but um, educational leadership is defined in the collective agreement as um, activity um, uh, taken at EBC and elsewhere to advance innovation, teaching, learning with impact beyond one's classroom. That is that is part of the definition contractually. And you're making me think that it shouldn't be. Um, and that maybe this is something that the faculty association ought to be looking at in the next round of contract negotiations. Um, because I, I, I think you're just right. If someone, if someone is producing outstanding work um, and for some reason, it's not getting taken up. Um, that um, that shouldn't mean it doesn't count as educational leadership. I I agree with you, but if, when I look at what's written down, I, I see something a little bit different. Thank you. Very interesting discussion, Maya. Did you unmuted? I don't know if you have something to add. Well, yeah, no, this, I, I was on a previous stream of the discussion. This was, this is also very interesting. So now I'm thinking about this, but to go back to your original question of what can department heads do, um, I'm a program director because in land and food systems, we don't have um, departments. So that's the closest I can be. And I'm the very first of the on the totem pole of the people who are providing feedback to faculty members who are thinking about reappointments and promotion and, and tenure. And um, I mean, what, what I can do in that position um, is to give a continuous advice to these um, young faculty members who are thinking about these, um, these things. We have regular annual meetings with um, pre-tenured faculty members. Um, again, most of them are in research stream. Um, in, in our faculty, I only had one educational leadership uh, um, colleague, uh, but she was just outstanding and um, she really didn't need any advice from me. Um, but in terms of research, because again, I mean, I, I, I see myself in this in-between world. I am neither in, either one of, of the, I don't really fit the mold. Um, so when I'm dealing with uh, co colleagues in research stream and they are doing something that uh, goes in towards the educational um, leadership or innovation in, in teaching, I am always careful how I frame my advice to them. Um, and um, you know how they should be positioning um, their their work um, um, pre tenure. I try to calm them down because uh, if they want to go too too crazy in terms of these things, if they are in research stream and if they want to do lots of educational leadership um, kind of activities or work, I would 
not recommend that um, because um, barriers are real. Um, the you know that's why we are having this this panel. But that being said, they shouldn't be discouraged. I mean, there are lots of young faculty members who are very keen to in the research stream who are very keen to put lots of effort into innovation in education. Um, and they shouldn't be told, which is constantly the message you are getting in you at UBC if you are in research stream. Don't, don't, you know, put too much effort into teaching. Um, they they need to position that that work so that it counts. Um, publishing papers about that work, serving on um, stuff that hasn't been mentioned, serving on um, editorial boards of um, educational journals. Those are some outstanding things that, um, you know, um, you know, show some impact that, that, that you, you might have. Um, obviously getting grants and stuff like that, doing workshops and all kinds of um, uh, presentations at conferences. Those are, those are things that are kind of add on to just not just to developing um, an educational resources that do get a bit more recognition um, in the traditional way of viewing um, our activities. Thank you, Maya. I appreciate you and talking a little bit about some things that might uh, fall under service too. So, mm -hmm. you know, being, I, I think, uh, being on the editorial board of a journal would, would count as, as service. Um, cause that's, that part sometimes gets a little bit, you know, it's a, it seems to be a smaller category. And so the, that we often don't talk about it quite as much. Um, I think reviewing, potentially reviewing, uh, other people's, uh, open textbooks. I know BC campus has a substantial review process and could also potentially count as service, right? So I'm noticing it is 10 after the hour and we have about 20 minutes so we may end a little bit early in case folks have another meeting to go to at 30 minutes after the hour. Um, and I did want to save a little time for um, questions from the participants here. We have a lot of questions that uh, we didn't quite get to, but I'm looking through them and going, well, we actually kind of talked about that one and that one and that one. So. Here's one that we haven't yet, and I'm actually going to open this out to everybody, um, panelists and participants, if anybody wants to uh, uh, answer. But um, this can be useful potentially for Amanda, <laughs> or if you've also heard uh, other thoughts, it's around activities or support services. So what activities or support services would you find do you find or would you find useful for promoting your OER work in reappointment, tenure, and promotion dossiers, or frankly, in promoting your OER work outside of that process as well? So just more generally. So any panelists and then any participants and any participants, if you have questions that are separate from that, please feel free to post in the chat or raise your hand. Go ahead, Agnes. Sure. Um, so I think one of the things is seeing how other people frame their work. And so I'm putting it out there. If anyone wants a copy of my dossier, you're welcome to have it. And not saying it's the best, but it's an example. And I think the more examples that we see, um, the easier it'll be for all of us to frame this. But I also think these opportunities to, you know, to just tell people about what we're doing um making those connections and i know bc campus has been really really fantastic for this um and we made some connections uh, in saskatchewan that ended up we collaborated together on some work um, but just getting the word out about who's doing what and i know will as as well has done the same thing um has been really helpful in generating collaborations letting people know what's out there um that it's available i don't know the best platform for that, but um, those conversations have been really essential in, in, my, in my history of OER. Thank you, Agnes. I agree uh, definitely with both of those sort of however you can network to find folks to collaborate can be super helpful. Jonathan. I always like um, as a sort of relatively low cost um, um, promotion and incentivizing feature for, for for things that um, that the university likes but doesn't uh, necessarily want to like actually put 
salaries and merits behind um, is uh, prizes. Um, so I, I would love to see, um, you know, a uh, um, two or three winners a year. UBC has awarded this excellent contribution to OER. And, you know, here's, I don't know, $2,000 as a token of thanks, but you also put the part you won the prize on your CD. Um, that's that's pretty inexpensive and uh, in the scheme of things, and I think it can be pretty valuable. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm kind of smiling because uh, uh, there's something in the works. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> Go ahead, George. Yeah. I I think yeah, I think it would be nice to to have sort of a dedicated OER conference or that sort of thing. It may be just me being ignorant about this, but if if we had a venue where um, where we could uh, exchange ideas or or you know show our work, that would be nice. It could be an incubator for new ideas. Uh, it could be an incubator for networking. Um, so uh, it could be an online conference, you know, which are easier to organize, I think. But but just a way of of you know promoting OER work that way and then hearing about ideas of others, I think, really be really nice. Great. I'm seeing that Amanda is putting a few things in the chat. Thank you, George. Um, just wanted to mention those. I don't know if everyone is following the chat, but uh, BC Campus does have awards for excellence in open education. So um, these are uh, open for nominations at all times. Um, and so anybody who wants to nominate someone, uh, then they're announced when, when they're chosen on a rolling basis. Uh, there's also the Open Education Conference. It's a North American conference um, that is has been online in the past few years, uh, partly started during COVID, but then has continued online, which has been really useful, actually, um, for those of us who um, have issues traveling for whatever reason. And then there's the Open Education Global Conference, which this year is happening in Edmonton, but can happen all over the world, right? So sometimes it can be <laughs> somewhat difficult to get to. But they also frequently, since COVID, have had... Um, online uh, options as well. So last year there was, the conference was in France, but there was also an online couple of days uh, conference too. So so there are some. George, I don't know if you were thinking about something a bit more local or, or what, but yeah. Yeah, a bit more local could be helpful as well. You know, it's part of, um, you know, the end of year events that we have that we may have a dedicated session on OER or something like that, that could be useful. Right. Okay. Thank you. We will take that uh, take that thought into account. Thanks. I'm also noting uh, Amanda says in the the chat when you receive the BC Campus uh, OER Excellence Award, we CC it to your department head, the VP Academic or Provost, and the President of the University, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. And I know Ryan has had his hand up for a while. Thank you for your patience. Would you like to go ahead, Ryan? Uh, first, I want to check. Can everybody hear me? Sometimes this little mic doesn't work very well, so that's yep. great. Um, I, I'm Ryan Brown. I'm with the Community Engagement Office here at Vancouver campus uh, in, uh, for UBC. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for the great conversation. It was um, obviously I'm on the administrative side. Uh, really great learning for me uh, to hear from faculty members and their conversations around uh, promotion and tenure and things like that. It's a part of my job trying to look at ways that we can improve promotion and tenure uh support that work from the faculty association side uh for community engagement specifically so a much broader um umbrella than just oer but um really helpful to hear about this particular aspect of people doing work that does engage beyond the the campus um i'm i heard a little bit there about um the challenge that culture has at uh, the university and that you know the recognition that uh, can be interpreted in what's in the collective agreement uh what a promotion and tenure committee might be looking for based on the type of relationship that you've been able to forge with them and um i'm wondering if a piece of work that i've been involved in for the last well i'm not so much uh, over the last year but uh, for a few years from just prior to when the pandemic hit uh, to, to just uh, last year, um, was a Canadian pilot of the Carnegie Foundation's community engagement classification. Um, I'm not sure if this is familiar to anyone on the panel, but um, we worked with uh, 15 other institutions to pilot 
the community engagement classification that to date is only in the US. Um, and the purpose was to test it and see how it fits in the Canadian context and then to try to see if it would work here in Canada. Uh, so a set of institutions are currently in the process of bringing that to Canada. So there will be a classification here. Um, and a big component of that is curricular engagement, co-curricular engagement, aspects of community-based research, um, really broad. Uh, so anything that engages with community beyond campus. Uh, and I'm just wondering how people think about uh, classification systems like this and whether they would have an impact on uh, UBC culture, um, maybe changes to the collective agreement in the future to say, hey, we need to keep up with this uh, classification system because other institutions are getting more engaged and they're showing baseline data about that type of engagement. Um, and just get some thoughts on, on the type of effect that that type of classification might have at UBC. Great, thank you, Ryan. Any thoughts from our panelists? I think Jonathan uh, first. Uh, let, let Lisa go first, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with like what exactly the implications of having a classification system like that's this would be. But, um, but certainly, I think things that recognize that this is a type of valued work um, um, can at, at least incrementally help. Um, I, I do think a lot of the culture derives from big things um, and. Um, I mean, one, one. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just true that that UBC um, values traditional peer reviewed scholarship more than it values um, teaching and educational reform and educational leadership. And one way that we see that is, um, is you know, these challenges to getting this kind of work recognized. Um, another really big way, I mean, this in a way, this is this is. Yeah, this is closer to it, actually. Um, like, like we said at the beginning, um, uh, educational leadership faculty um, have, um, uh, you know, this sort of thing as at least officially recognized as part of, um, as, as, as part of the job as educational leadership. Um, and um, so it's, uh, it's harder to get recognized on the research stream. Um, you know, nominally, um, you know, these are just two streams of faculty. Um, but uh, with that, with no, um, with no kind of hierarchy attached to them. But if you look at um, pay, um, it's very clear that uh, UBC considers people who are publishing in, in scholarly material um, at, um, and teaching less than the education than the educational faculty do. Um, um, uh, we're paid way more, and that's always been the case. Um, there's no, there's nothing, you know, that's not in the contract that that should be the case, but that's that's certainly the practice. Um, and um, and you know, the new collective agreement I think has a one percent uh, thing for educational leadership, and that which will you know make this you know a slightly smaller problem. But uh, but so I mean the the the, the very deep structural um, uh, what does the university care about um, feeds a lot of the culture and. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not against um, a, a, a classification system that says, you know, here's the thing and we need to recognize it and think that it's important. And, and I, like I said at the start of this comment, I think that might be like, that might make it slightly better than not having that. Um, but, I, but I think if we want to talk about like really changing um, the, the culture, that really starts um, in material waste. Um, and, and I think, I think pay is like a really um, central one. Um, and, you know, I was, I was talking earlier about it, here are some things you can do there cheap. And, and, and that's, the, that's my pragmatic side. Um, but, but my, like, how do you actually like change the culture to solve this problem side? It's, it's going to be expensive. Um, and, and it's going to involve, um, really, um, changing which kinds of uh, scholarship and which kinds of scholars are, uh, valued in, um, in the highest ways at, at this and all universities. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Elisa, did you want to add something? Well, I, I hesitate to say anything after that, because I think that was the really important point. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's really, that kind of nails it. Um, I'm always skeptical about classification systems. Um, I think that 
being able to quantify things is always dangerous um, in in worlds where the institution that you're working for really loves quantification. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the data they've collected is any good. And, but if they can make a chart out of it, it becomes usable. And so I, I like not, you know, I, I, I think we need fewer charts fewer <laughs> describing our accomplishments. I think we have to take up the mantle of doing qualitative assessment, deep assessment of our, of our work. And, um, and I think, you know, this does to some extent come back to what heads and directors can do on behalf of their promote, you know, their candidates that they're putting up. And that might be doing the work or maybe gathering the work to make the case to the dean's committees or the SAC to say, I have assessed this work. No, it doesn't have the citation count or whatever. And this goes for any kind of work. No, it doesn't have the citation count. Zero people have read this paper. Nobody has clicked this link, but this is amazing work. Uh, we can tell because this is because we are also experts and we can see that this is excellent work. And firing somebody who has produced this would be a tremendous loss. If they're doing this caliber, caliber of work, we don't need other people's opinions. We know that this is good. Of course, that's the extreme end, but I think that heads and directors could be more courageous about making statements like that and going to bat for people based on their own assessments of the excellence of the people in their in their unit. Um, and I think that in, I think there's this big fear that people will, when left up to their own devices, do poor quality work. They'll get away with writing papers that are under, you know, that are not um, rigorous. They'll they'll produce courses that are lackluster, but just because there's a video about them, they'll claim they've made a thing. And I think there are some people who do that. I think there are some, you know, there are some bad papers and there are some bad online resources that people have put together. So you want to be able to distinguish, but the heads should be able to do that. They should be able to look and say like, yeah, well, I know there's a there's a risk that people put something online and then we say, oh, it's online, so it must be good. That's not what we're saying. We've looked at this one and it's excellent. And you should believe that it's excellent because I'd say it's excellent. Um, and my opinion is important. It's not it's not a, a lack. It's not an ad hoc opinion. This is a well considered, well informed, informed opinion. Um, so I think maybe that. Yeah, that's that's all I want to say. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Well, I put out a call in the chat in case there were any other questions. I'm not hearing or seeing anything from others. Um, so I think with that, um, just because I know some people, including myself, have another meeting <laughs> starting in just a few minutes, um, wanted to say thank you so much to all of our panelists. This was an incredibly rich discussion and we didn't get through all the questions, but we actually got through most of the topics, even though, um, and uh, just really value all of the, the contributions that you've made and your straightforward and, and really thoughtful um, responses to these questions, which give us all some good food for thought and uh, potentially action in the future. Thank you all to, to those who have uh, attended today as well. And um, I hope that this has been a useful session for you. Okay, thanks everyone. I hope you have the good uh, rest of your day.